Oh, you don't mind going on YouTube as well, do you? I know. <laughs> Fine, all right. Perfect. Right, welcome back to Process, the podcast. Today, we are joined by Ross Cahoon, and I didn't butcher it that bad this time. <laughs> but yeah, fellow PT, so it's great to have Ross on the podcast. Thanks for coming on, mate. No problem, mate. Thank you for having me. No worries. So today, it's quite good to have a, another, obviously, PT on the podcast who is, came from a footballing background, which is something that I'm, I like talking about, that transition from, obviously, coming from a PT, obviously, as a footballer, sorry, coming through to now personal training. So in terms of personal training, what have you been doing over, over lockdown? Because obviously, I know it's a funny situation for everybody to kind um, of adapt with your clients and stuff. Yeah, I sort of like assessed the situation as everyone did. Um, spoke to a few guys, like other other coaches in in the field. Um, one of them being Alex Kitchen, who I know you had on recently yeah. on your podcast, and um, sort of bumped heads is what we thought would be a good way to get as many people moving and, and keep moving, sort of thing. Um, obviously, he's more Newcastle and I'm Sunderland based, so didn't think the model would clash like what we were doing in terms of like online. So I've been doing like a a private um, subscription Facebook group, um, live workouts. Um, the guys, the clients that I originally had within my training club, um, they've sort of switched across to the online side of things, which I was already running alongside the face-to-face stuff. Um, so they're getting a taste of that experience in terms of programming through the app that I use and things like that. And then as part of their, their monthly sort of subscription so to speak they're getting to the option to do the lives as well um if they want to but yeah i built up a good little community i think through facebook my girlfriend's got a big following on facebook getting a lot of people through through her as well so i think there's about 60 people in the group at the minute so it's it's, it's decent I just take pride in like the fact that you can offer something low ticket and keep as many people moving do you know what i mean so yeah I think, that's, that, what I think that's good though, because like I've seen a lot of gyms and stuff have been doing like Zoom classes and stuff like that, and like yeah. you've good, you've used your own initiative and kind of seen the opportunity. You might get a few extra clients out about it, like through it as well if people exactly, are seeing yeah. they are still grafting so hard and stuff. Anyway, but mm-hmm. away from the PT side for a second, we'll start off something I like talking about because obviously you're from a football and background. You mm-hmm. started how young were you when you started football? Probably everybody's like five, six, seven four, normally. Four, five, yeah. something on them. Yeah, Lamp and Lions. <laughs> yeah, back in, the, back in the day. So yeah. kind of just talking through your kind of football career because I know you were at Southern for a time. How did that kind of come about from when you were young, obviously, first signing? Mm. Yeah, I am. Um, I think it was when I was about 10. I think I was always bigger than everyone else at my age. I stood out, I think, a lot on the pitch. The way I played and being a defender and that I was quite aggressive for me age and my size. So I think I attracted a lot of uh I wasn't very I wouldn't say I was very technically blessed at that age either. Yeah. Um and I had the option to sign for Newcastle and Middlesbrough and Sunland all at once, believe it or not. Yeah. After being in Sunland's development for a year, like obviously you, did you ever do that process? Yeah, that? I, my own was Different like now, wasn't that thing? Yeah, I don't know what they do now, but my own was I was literally there for like two weeks. Or something like that. I think yeah. they need to keep that always starting. used to piss me off. That people used to rock up, <laughs> come in for a week, and then I'd be, and I'd have done a year of like hard graft. Anyway, I'd, I was in there for a year, and then I eventually had the option to sign for all three. But I supported someone, so I just went. I signed for well, someone at yeah. the age of ten, and then it just went on from there until I was nineteen. So I had a yeah. canny stint. I so you always um. So did you sign? It was a scholarship first. Did you did you go sign a pro there? So how long were you full time? Uh, I was full time for just the two year mate. I only did a YT. Oh, right, did you? Yeah, I didn't get that. I didn't get there over the line mate, for that pro, like uh, our third year scholar. Yeah, how was your? How did you find your scholarship? Did you enjoy it? Hmm. I did. Like, I think when you're younger and you're seeing all the other lads walk in with the wash bags and that, and you just want to be one of them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's full time. That's your job for them two years. And you think it's going to be like absolutely amazing. I think all my pals thought. Wow, he's got the dream job, him. But there's so much that goes into it for people who don't know and aren't around it. And that's why it's good to have conversations with people yeah. like yourself and that. Um, it's there's a lot of aspects to it, and just like, like honestly, it's crazy. And from what I've heard from um, one of me, one of the lads who I've recently been playing with, Jamie Corbin, who was in Europe, oh, right. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, at the time, even when we were there, we always seemed to think that Newcastle had it a lot easier, and it always seemed more relaxing. Um, you did half the hours we did by the sound of it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but there's just a lot more that goes into it than just wrapping up training and going home and living that sort of 
professional footballer lifestyle because it isn't. You like yeah. nothing compared to them. See, it's funny that you say that, that you thought that we didn't do as much as you do, but we used to look at your uh, training ground and think their training ground, their setup's ridiculous compared yeah, to like yeah. ours because you've got like a pool, you've mm-hmm. got like all the pitches, like a farm for well, it's not like a farm, but like, know, yeah, the fields and thing. fields and fields. Yeah, you've got the dome thing now. I think the Academy of Light is literally probably from all the clubs that we've been to and played over the years, probably one of the best. It's probably up there in the top five or it was. Is. Now mm. everyone's had the money pumping in like Spurs and Man City and that. There's probably took off from then, but like it was probably one of the top five, like definitely. Yeah, it was a massive, massive set. And they had a decent, I uh, said so I had a few lads come through the ages. Like, I don't know <laughs> if it would have been your age or a few years below, but obviously, pick John Pickford's from there. He's a big one. That's yeah, kind of yeah, stands out for me, big, but. He was above him. I like, saw. The, the lads who were around me were sort of like Denver Hume, who's just obviously playing now. He was the yeah. other We've got Ethan Robson, who's sort of around things. Uh, I think there's a few lads, mate, who's gone on to play like Scottish SPL and that. Um, yeah. George Honeyman, obviously, he was a couple of years ago. Gooch, like all them type of lads were all around our, our group, so, yeah. Not a bad little What was your kind of, like, so you talk about you were training quite a bit compared to us, apparently. What was your kind of normal day, the normal routine oh, when you were there? Not, How are they, mate? Talk us through it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd have to be in latest 8 o'clock, 8, 8 a.m. That was the latest. We'd all have jobs to do as soon as I got in, clean all the pros' boots, coaches' boots, um, make sure our boot room and everything was clean. All of that before anything started. Some days we'd have, it, we'd have education. Some days we'd got up and go in the gym straight away and then go and train on the pitch. Then come in, get our dinner. Then have a bit of time to ourselves. Then come train again outside. Um, and then come in and we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to leave the building until 6pm. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and I know you guys used to leave at one or something. Like, <laughs> Not me, mate. Minutes. Not me, mate. I was there. I was there till at least four. I was injured all the time, so the injured lads. Oh, were yeah. there, but, but uh, right, so that was that was that was our typical day life. But then uh, we weren't allowed to leave until like everything was perfect and clean, and it was always a right chew on to get all the lads together to get. And I was captain as well, so yeah. I was just like stressed out. Yeah, trying to get everything perfect because you just get judged on every little detail in the clubs. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, that I didn't realize how bad like. How much you actually oh, train at six yeah, o'clock? Yeah. That's going to be below minimum wage, I think, thinking about it. To what, what you're yeah, on you don't want to know what it worked out. We worked out in a week once, right? I think from what we were getting paid at the time, we worked out it was like £1.90 for the hours that we did. <laughs> I swear on, including like the away trips and that and the game on the Saturday, it worked out £1.90 or something. That's crazy. <laughs> that is mental. That. So you're doing that. So what were you using? We use Monday, Tuesday, like college or something on Wednesday. That's what we did. We were in oh, Monday, we... Tuesday, college Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, game Saturday, and then off Sunday, like most of the time, unless like Aye. the reserves needed you or something. Yeah, I think I was just college day Monday, college Wednesday. But then we on the on the days of the college, we'd have to get in even earlier before college to do our gym sessions. And mm. then yeah, yeah, and then train in the afternoon as well. And then if you didn't finish your college work, you weren't allowed to train and all this sort of thing. So uh, there was quite a lot of pressure, I'd say, yeah, uh, to, to achieve in all sort of aspects. But the the, the staff, the, like the education guys, were class to be fair. They uh-huh. tried to take as much off us as, as they could, like. Um, but yeah, that was our typical typical That's week. Good. And we just, I was going to say, so you felt you felt like there was pressure, kind of thing. Do you feel like th- there was pressure for you to kind of like either? succeed maybe from the coaches or from anybody else not just to succeed but to kind of go up the ranks and like train with the first team and stuff did you, did you feel like there was loads loads of pressure from um i think when when we were there and i don't know if you feel like this as well they didn't have the under 23s thing did they it was just it was 21s, like 18, 21s it was a, first team yeah so like for someone to play in the 21s when we were there it was a big deal and for someone to play in the 21s and train with the first team was also a big deal yeah. Whereas now, I think the 18s all go and play with the 23s, and the, uh, most of the 23s train with the first team, so it's not yeah, like a big it's deal. Yeah, it's like, it's like a like, bad thing if you play for your own age group now. Towards the end, when I was there, anyway, that's what it felt like. When, when, when I was there, it was like, you've got to earn just to play. Maybe when we were there, when we signed the first year scholar, you had to earn the right just to play on that 18s team, like to be starting with the, with the second years, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the competition and like... Like when you were under 18, the first team seemed miles away. Whereas now you get put in the spotlight just like that. Like uh-huh. and you get to play in the 23s, check your trade and stuff. Like you're in the spotlight straight away. Yeah. Have a good couple of games. The way football is these days, your it's career crazy. just kind of propels, yeah. isn't it? I think my I, worked, I think my time we probably because we're the same age, so we grew up with the exact same thing. But 
when I was my first year scholar, it I didn't my debut for the under eighteen was actually in the FA Youth Cup. I didn't play a game. Yeah. So like it was it was because of injuries and stuff. So they obviously had Freddie Wood was my age, so he was playing all the under eighteen oh, games I, I, and he got I injured. And I was literally just playing under sixteens like most of the time because obviously yeah, yeah. you keep us can play down, but there was it did feel like a lot of pressure playing for the under eighteens, but eventually I kinda of got into it and into it and stuff. The pressure the pressure for us lads in it at Sunderland was um a lot off the pitch. Like you were judged on so much like stuff, like just the way like I felt like me personally, and I'm not one to talk about on the club, but it's only comes from certain quarters, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying any names, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like as soon as you walk in that building, you had to like put on this front. And it was so tiring to do that for two years straight. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You couldn't be yourself in our place, like it was like you were getting judged no matter what. Sounds like, like a boarding school. Honestly, mate, it was it's yeah. quite strict. Like that's why we always used to think when we're seeing news and we come to plays and that on match days and that, you all look so much more relaxed, you just express yourself more. And I think that's what led to a lot of lads at Sunderland sort of playing within themselves in a way mm-hmm. because they were so worried about making a mistake. And uh, you have to be a certain personality, I think, to rise above that. And I think that's what sort of instilled into me to like, as, as, as and kind of made as what I am now in terms of mental strength, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so this, that sort of leads on. And if you can't handle that, I think you just crumble, which a lot yeah. of lads do. I think, like, like you just said, like it, it'll instill a lot of discipline and make mentality into you but mm-hmm. like you said a lot of lads will crumble under that but I think coaches nowadays are kind of becoming more open to the fact that some lads don't perform better through that mm-hmm. technique through like discipline like you need to be like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're in the military like a lot of lads will just either say like fuck off I'm not doing that or they're going to yeah, the shell yeah, yeah. so I think coaches are getting a lot more kind of open towards that but speaking about the amount that you were trained did you feel as a young lad they made you train too much I know for myself Mm. I've picked up a lot of injuries when I was young, probably due to the fact of the amount of training that I was doing, oh. especially on the like the Ast- did you train on the astral turf quite a bit? Yeah, mate. When you're a when you're a school kid, the amount of training we did. I was never in school for the last um because did you just do that thing that the Premier League brought in the three PP thing or something, whatever it was. What was that? The we EPP. Did... I can't remember what it was. We literally used to get picked up in a minibus, uh, like one yeah. o'clock every day, and they take to the club, and we used to train like even on school days. We train them as soon as we got there, so like half two, and then we go and get our dinner, and then we train again on the night till like half eight. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've been I remember. In school in the morning. <laughs> I, I've, I totally forgot about that, you know, because yeah, cause right. it was we used to do it two two days a week. I think it was. I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah, yeah. I'd go to school in the morning, have me lunch. I would literally have my lunch, get mini bus, and I was the furthest away because I'm like I'm like Carlisle oh, way. Yeah. So I was. Yeah. It was like probably an hour and a half journey for me. Obviously, having to go around all the other schools, get yeah. the training. Uh, yeah, kit on yeah. straight out straight out for training back in bit of like school work I think it was have you have you yeah, like, we did that as well. have like a snack it wasn't even like it was like sandwiches and an apple or something like that yeah that's exactly what we did yeah. uh, and then what uh, then was it more college or a gym session before training at night and then we train at like half six till half eight at night same same I, it must have been rolled out across the Premier League teams and um, mate like especially this these these days like with social media and kids just wanting to be even more with the mates and that. Mate, my brother was at Newcastle a couple of years ago for, for a couple of years and he just hates football now. Yeah. It's so sad to see, but he does because it's just so much. It, some, I know if you've got to have some sort of like, you've got to have something in you to get through that and still actually enjoy it because like it's, it takes, it sucks the fun out of it sometimes. Like unless you've got like a really good group of lads and a, or a really good coach who's very like yeah, yeah, enthusiastic or whatever or who understands like that mentality. Like definitely. a lot of young lads will probably lose. That's why you probably see a lot of lads. You've probably played with lads who were like 12, 13, 14, 15. And they were like, right, this kid's going to be the next one. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And then it gets to like 17, 18 and they lose interest completely. And they just uh-huh. lose their head. Like, we had some great lads like who played England, even England in the 16, 17. And then oh, yeah. down the line, just completely. Lost I know exactly what you're about. I know exactly what you're about as well. There's a, but, um, there's a few. When we were when we were full time in that as well, I remember the first year being a scholar. I was just thinking, when are my legs gonna get used to this? Like, yeah. I just couldn't keep up in terms of recovery, train, recovery, train. And obviously, the second years are pissing all over you because they've done it for a year already. Yeah. Like it took a while, but once it does, like it's it's fine. But you train like probably three times as much as what the first team do. Uh-huh. You know what I mean, which I never. Who was that? Was it? Was I speaking to? It was somebody I've done a podcast with. I can't remember who it was, but we were saying the exact same thing. Like, why is the first uh-huh. team training for this long? 
and they're that level and we're training we're yeah, young yeah. lads and we're, we're training about four hours a day longer like yeah. if that's what the best rock up at half nine the good ones would come in at eight or half eight or something and do some extra work and then they'd yeah. be fucking off by half twelve I know. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's mental. But I do think, like, young lads, like, I used to say to them, when, like, towards when I was injured in Newcastle, right at the end of my time there, I used to say to the young lads, like, if, if there's a day where you've got, like, you're a little bit sore, your legs are tired and stuff, and they get you to do double days, say to them, look, my legs are tired. Like, I feel like right. I'm not I'm not going to be able to give my best out there, so I'm not going to benefit from doing it, or, like, right. I need a rest. So, like, don't be afraid to say that. And, like, if they've got a problem. You know what baffles me now, mate? Like, obviously, the more we know, like, uh, as we educate ourselves in terms of the fitness, the strength side of things, the condition side of things, and obviously rest and recovery, it's like, it's strange that the, the S&C coaches there, like, let that happen. It sort of makes you think how much control did they have. Yeah. Because I remember them, he used to pull us to the side sometimes and go, shouldn't really be doing this, but so-and-so wants you to, and it's like, aye. Right. Now, now I look back on it, it's like, uh-huh. Probably wasn't best for us, you know what I mean? I know. A big th- <laughs> a big thing for for me was coming in the day after certain g- nighttime games, especially. So like obviously I, like, we spoke just before the podcast, I read a book called Why We Sleep at Matthew Walker, like mm-hmm. how important sleep is for recovery. And yeah, say yeah. you'd play a game at night time that kicks off at like half seven. You don't get you don't get home till half ten, eleven, maybe eleven o'clock, it depends mm-hmm. how far away you live. And you don't never sleep after a game. Like I was I used uh-huh. to go to sleep until about half one, two in the morning. And then yeah. you're up at like seven in the morning after a game, especially for an outfielder, if you've like played 90 minutes, you're not getting that recovery. And I remember there was a situation, it was actually, we played, we had a tournament in Germany. Uh, for whatever reason, our flight got cancelled or whatever. So we didn't actually get, we had to get a flight from Germany to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Paris, Paris to Newcastle. It was actually to London. And then a bus from London back up to Newcastle. We didn't get wow. into Newcastle until four in the morning. And we had to be in training next day because the first team needed numbers. And like, I Fair don't enough. know, like, I had a, because I lived obviously further away, so I had about an hour sleep and then you're up training. Like, the like, yeah, of you. <laughs> well, to be fair, I luckily I wasn't training with the first team, so it didn't matter. Like, the lads who weren't with the first team just did a bit like box and stuff like that. It wasn't anything. Mm. But like, the likelihood of someone getting injured from doing that, especially sitting on a bus and sitting on a plane for so long and then not sleeping, mm. but it does surprise you that they don't take that into consideration yeah, especially yeah. for young lads but anyway we'll Being, um, I've never really thought about my time there actually in depth like what I am now it's, it's a weird one like to talk over it again but like stuff comes back to you as you do do you know what I mean yeah like, like, it's I, just the past isn't it uh-huh. is what it is like, when I did my third po- first podcast I was like writing stuff down like going through and I was like oh yeah, that happened that happened and I speak to people about aye. it and I'm like oh I went did that did that, that. it's crazy yeah. like but uh, they do I do feel like the, the train you especially when you first come in as a scholarship I think the older you get the better it becomes, mm-hmm. which is weird. You have, but you have to get through those early years. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why a lot of lads struggle both mentally and physically with the demands yeah. of it. Uh, so coming from, so the end of your Sunderland career, you finished your two-year scholar, you mm-hmm. didn't get a contract. What was kind of going through your mind at that time? I know it's a tough time for a lot of yeah. a lot of young lads. Um, with myself. It was kind of, I always knew it was going to be 50-50, whether I did and whether I didn't get a contract there. And they openly said that to me, actually, in the, the meeting yeah. when they sit you down. Um, and it was a case of, like, the lads ahead of me were, like, there were some good players ahead of us, basically, in the years above. So it was like, what's best for you? You're not really going to progress here. And I, I understood that. And mate, I'd been there a long time. And I'm quite mature. I was always quite mature for my age. And I thought, fuck it. I'm coming from a Premier League club. I'll get another club here. I've got an agent, blah de blah I went, yeah, yeah, I'm sound with that. I'm happy to move on. I want to start afresh. And I thought maybe he's going down a couple of leagues. I'd get more chance to win the first team and stuff like that. Yeah. And then obviously went with a few trials, a few clubs here and there, and it just didn't happen, mate. Like, it's one of them things. And you yeah. realise how much stuff needs to come into play when you're, when you're not a local lad to them clubs. Like, they've got to put you up in digs. They've got, like, especially the lower leagues, they don't have the funds to do it. Like, I got yeah. offered a couple of contacts in places in Scotland. And they were like, this is going to be your wage. And I was like, oh, I'm decent. But you're going to have to pay for your digs out of that. Yeah. And go home with your petal money. I was going to end up with pretty much not much money. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So uh, that was kind of my end. And then I went to Gateshead, um, signed the contract there, thinking that I was going to be pretty much with the first team. And I ended up doing a college course. And I was like, this isn't for me. Like, So... Um, I ended up just going on the Northern League and playing some men's football yeah. at, at, at a younger age. So. Were, were you were you a Gateshead when I went on loan there? 
He must have mm, been, you know. I can't remember. I, was, I Tom, was Tom White there, no? The yeah, he would have been. I will have been. Because I played one or two games for the like the reserves. I played against South Shields in like a cup thing. I played. Right. I was only there three months. Because oh, I, right, I, so I, you I, might. I moved on after that. Like, but I think, nah, yeah, I might not have been mate. I, I, I can't remember. To be honest. Oh, fair enough. Um, I, saw, I didn't realise you went to Gateshead. To be fair. Yeah, it was a little little so, stint there. Totten, go back to what you said about when you kind of left, left Sun and they told you that sort of, you're obviously mm-hmm. not going to be there. And your mindset was like, right, I'll be fine. I was the exact same thing. Yeah. I think a lot of lads are in the exact same position. The thing positive about, especially coming from like a, well, Sun and were Premier League at the time, weren't they? Were they mm-hmm. still, yeah. So coming from a Prem team, you're thinking like, yeah, like I've had two years experience with the Prem team. I can say this, that, yeah. there, I've got an agent. I'll go somewhere, whether it be like League One, and get in there, play a few reserve games, and maybe play first team and get experience and whip my way back up. Like everyone's in the same same mindset, I feel. But it's not that it isn't. It doesn't always run that smoothly, especially nah. trialing. Uh, yeah, like the I mean, for trialing. me, for me, it was tough in respect that, like, when I was there, because you're instilled with such good standards at clubs like Sunderland and Newcastle, like everything. And obviously, I told you how strict I was. Well, so I was bob on with everything, yeah. and like I felt like I was like, oh, I'm easily. Like one of the best here, like I'm better than him, better than yeah. him, better than him. And then you're thinking, oh, sure, he has a contract, do you know what I mean? And yeah, it just doesn't yeah. quite come. Like, oh, actually, my most uh, successful trial was in the last couple of weeks when I was at Summer and I went to Burnley and I'd done three weeks there. I got asked back another week, another week. Um, played like in a closed behind doors, a behind closed doors game, sorry, against Hull's first team. Excelled in that game. The 21s manager wanted us to sign for them. And I, I can't actually remember. I think it was, oh, that was it. Sean Dyche had watched that game and he'd said, like, his physical stature, like, I'm I'm six foot with an Air Max on, you know what I mean? So, yeah, <laughs> six um, foot with an Air Max on. He was like, you and obviously you now from Burnley Sunday, players, like, <laughs> 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 you know, Burnley players, like, he's like, his physical stature just isn't there. So, again, it would be pointless to me signing him because he'd never played in my Prem team. So, I had to just take that one on the chin as well. And that's when I went, then went off to Gateshead, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's but I, that was that kind of a, the trial process. It was like, surely I'm gonna get in here. Surely I'm gonna get in here, and it just doesn't, yeah. doesn't happen. I know that's the thing. Like the teams do come up with silly excuses. Like I done a podcast with you know Liam Smith, who was at Newcastle a year older uh-huh. than us. Uh-huh. I just don't know what. Uh, he, I think he's, that? I think he's trying to get find a team and stuff like that. But he's he? obviously the same with me. Struggled really bad with injuries, which is I got him on the podcast. Right. Uh, so me and him done one, which will probably be up before this one. I'll be up. So mm-hmm. we were talking about just trialing places and teams giving you the worst excuses for not signing, whether it be money mm. or it be this. But the fact that they've invited you there, surely that means that they're like they're, they're going to have the yeah. financial budget, or they're going to like actually show interest. And if you're any good, they'll sign you. That's what you think, but it doesn't always work like that. Like you said, nah, there's so many variables. <laughs> team, teams having to put you up in digs and stuff. Like I had the same thing in Scotland. Like you get given so much money, and then you've still got to find your own place. It's like yeah. The money, it's like a sacrifice. Like that's what I've seen it as. Like, right, I'll give it. A, I'll give it a go. I'll see. I'll take the money, like crap money, for a few years, and hopefully, I can like get some games and go somewhere else, make a move. But it's never, never runs the, the same nah. as you as it goes in your head. Nah, definitely not. And then I just thought, like, when I got to a point, because I always um, had myself been at a certain position in life, like by a certain age. So when I was roaming around in the college at Gates, I had no disrespect, but, but like obviously. I didn't see myself there, so I thought, right, I'll go and play men's football, I'll get a bit of pot money, and I'll just start like pushing towards a career that I'm gonna enjoy, do you know what I mean? So Yeah, yeah. So when did the kind of fitness did you always have a like a passion for fitness? Like you said you're always a big, big I, lad anyway. Did you always have that yeah, passion? Definitely. I mean, when I was at the club, I'd always be doing probably like I'm saying, we we're, we're training too much, but I always loved the gym sessions anyway, so I'd always do an extra up a session or yeah. I'd sneak in. We had this. We had a pool, and we'd had like a recovery session that we do, which you only meant to do the day after a game. But I used to crack it off on a night time, like you do a few lens, and there was like twenty stations of dumbbells in the water, and you do lots of stuff. <laughs> I'd always just try and do extra work, and, get, and probably end up being a bit too top heavy. But that was like my first sort of experience with fitness and that. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I think when I come out of the full time football and not having to worry about doms and shit like that, I am um, my local gym. There's a PT there, and one of my mates worked there as well, so he always used to train with him. So then I, I always used to tag along and train with them both. And this guy's like an old school, like he's in amazing shape, and yeah. he's like strong as fuck. And I, I just got the bug, mate. Like the, 
the blood, sweat, and tear type of lifting type of thing, like all yeah, through yeah. bodybuilding. That was my first real experience of it. Like, I, I must have put on so much size in that time. Not that I'm yeah. big now, but do you know what I mean? <laughs> Just myself for like yeah. a year or that's, a, that guy. that's the thing when you like step out of football and you're actually, you're not, because obviously when you're playing football, doing double, like you were saying, you were there till six, six, six at night playing games, right. especially as an outfielder. You're burning that many calories that the amount of food that you actually eat to actually kind of put some tissue on. And then your body's not recovering the same way as it is yeah, yeah. without all that extra cardio, we'll call it. Yeah. So, like, you just, you'll just you just blow up. If you, if you, I think if I was you, about 79 kilograms and I was a summoned. And yeah. I can easily be 88, like, just yeah. chilling. Like, do you know what I mean? So, just shows, obviously, you, you grow up as well, but just shows how much tissue you can build when you're not doing as much uh, um, cardio, so to speak. Yeah. Mm. So when did you kind of start your PT career? So you was it when you were a caterer or did you go to like the non-league team and then start it? Um, I was already doing a little bit of... To, oh, that was it. Uh, when I was at Sunnan, one of the tutors, one of the female tutors had a, a local fitness... Um, what would you class it as? Class, so to speak, company. Right. It was in Brooklyn, and Sunnan. And uh, I always like obviously shown interest in our business because I always knew I'd like fitness on the side. And I always used to think, if this doesn't go right, then I can go into fitness. And she always said, oh, yeah, there'll be a job there for you. There'll be a job there for you. So I'd done like a Metafit course and stuff and went and taught like it was all females and that and like the girly type of classes and stuff. Yeah. Taught Metafit, was doing 6 a.m.s in a freezing cold car park four times a week for her, <laughs> which. Um, Led hey. us to get pneumonia. <laughs> yeah, actually did. And then, uh, I did, what else did I do after that? I started working for Skinny Pigs. Have you heard of Skinny Pigs in Sunland? Mainly uh, Sunland, but they're... Have you not heard of Skinny Pigs, no? Nah. Mate, the I'm, biggest I'm, female... I'm like, oh, is it like a big company or is it just based in Sunland? Oh, yeah, well, it is in, it is in, it is in the North East. It's like the biggest fitness company in the North East in terms oh, I'm of... Like, from, I'm from the hills. I'm from out on the hills, mate. No, nothing <laughs> ever gets... The, we don't even have Domino's delivery around here, man. Do you know? Shit. Nah, no, nothing happens around here. That's good. It keeps you skinny, man. I know. But, um, I had a little stint with them as well, like teaching all the classes and stuff. So it was always just classes, really. Yeah. And then I thought, like, I, I don't believe in all of this type of style of training and that and the aspect of everything that goes with it. So I'm going to do my PT course. And I had it in my head that... If you go and work somewhere that seems to be more high end, i.e., Newcastle, that's what I had in my head, I'm going to earn more money. So, my first PT job was in DW Biker, and it takes yeah. us like 50 minutes to get there. I don't know why. Do you know how it's one of them decisions you take? Yeah. And you just think, why the fuck did I ever do that? <laughs> yeah, I was driving there, getting stuck in A1 traffic and everything, but I did that for like five months, and that was brutal. That's where yeah. I probably earned my stripes as a PT, because like, I had no clients, but I went straight on to rent. So I was paying £540 a month. I had no clients, Easy. never PT before. And I just went in all guns blazing and I think I had about 15 clients within three weeks. That's good, that, mate. Fair play, yeah. Like, That's the right. thing. You've got to, like, you literally throw yourself in the deep end straight away there with the rent. That's right. a, lot, a lot of rent as well for that, Jim. Is that yeah. all, it's always, like... You know, it's it is when you do the full, because you could do it, like, in blocks. You could do hours for them. And then pay a little bit, and I just used to think, I'm not fucking working for them. I'm not working <laughs> myself. I've done PT, I'm working yeah. myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I just went straight in at the debt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, at least you've done that though, because rather than driving 50 minutes for like two clients and then having to like wait a few hours and having another one later on, you probably, yeah. you probably got them all out of the way, which is decent. So that was your kind of first first BT job. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and I think, uh, like, you, if I so, didn't have. What was I going to say? Well, you know when you started the Metafit, were you still at Sunderland or did you left Sunderland by then? Or you no, I left Sunderland then. Oh, you were a Yeah, I was oh, a right. um, And I think like, but like, like, like what we were saying before, the stuff that football, it even makes or breaks you type of thing, lads crumbling and all that. I think the fact that I could handle that, putting in that very uncomfortable gym scenario, like a lot of people couldn't, because you've got to, it's like cold calling, like sales, isn't it? You've got to walk up to them, introduce yourself. Yeah. You've got to be a type of person to do it. And like, yeah. I think everyone likes the idea of being a PT, but when you're starting a business and you're going to a commercial gym, you've got to like be on it. And that's what that guy who I was training with for that little stint where he was just relentless with like stuff like that. So yeah. I was like sending him texts and that, and he, he texts us every day saying, go and get another client, go and get another client. And I'd be like, aye, right. Pumping you up for it. Yeah, like, which, which I'm really grateful for because it's paid off. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Every time I go somewhere new, I'm just like, right, let's go. This is what I need to do. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, 
Yeah, I think um, people think PT is just like right. If you look good, you'll get clients. But like, yeah. you see, you see, probably see PTs in the gym. They're like they're built and they're huge, but they just don't look approachable. The new one wants to go and talk to them. Like nobody will, yeah, yeah. and they're not going to go and talk to somebody else because they think they're too good to go and talk to somebody else. They want yes, people to come to them. That's the big thing. Aye. It's a There's big so ma- much ego in uh, in personal training. That's crazy. Yeah, you're probably that's one if, thing I've learned. Yeah, you'd probably be more successful being like a a skinnier lad who's dead approach will go and talk to anybody and just get someone mm-hmm. people rather than just being that evil just definitely big, big man for that for that type of clientele definitely like i i you're right yeah um, so speak, speaking about ego you know when you left obviously from full-time football then you started mm-hmm. doing these metaphor class and stuff did you mm-hmm. kind of have to did you find it hard the transition like mentally because i know a lot of people mm-hmm. going from especially a premier league club probably they've got that ego like i'm a like I was at this level kind of thing. I need like yeah. I shouldn't be getting up at six AM in car parks doing classes and stuff like that and doing this or like doing whatever job kind of thing. It's a completely different mm. lifestyle. It's a in a way it's a big drop down. Some people say it's a drop down, but yeah. Did you find it tough at all or mentally challenging? Mm, yeah, you know definitely. I think I think uh although I had my fingers on a lot of pies, like I wasn't earning much money and blah 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 and I was doing a lot of stuff. And at the time that was probably the worst time I've been, like mentally not knowing where I'm going, completely lost. Like I remember I'd be getting, I'll just say it, I was in balls of tears. And my mind, like thinking, man, what the hell am I meant to do in that? And my girlfriend was constantly like trying to help us out and stuff, and and, and where to go, and um, what's the next step type of thing. Because like I say, I always had this thing in my mind that I had to be somewhere by a certain age. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that was like added pressure on myself, and then. But I was always like, I'd say I was always used to try and work as hard as I possibly could. So I knew once I had a clear vision, like I, I was fine, happy getting up at whatever time it needs to be done to get the job done. You know what I mean? So yeah. But it is tough for for lads, I think, because a lot of them you don't really get. Wait, like, the fact that you're not in school for like the last year because you're getting took out to do this, uh-huh. high, whatever it was called, the EPP thing, whatever it was called, um, and then obviously the qualifications you do at the club. It's just like a bog standard B tech, isn't it? Yeah, it's like it's, so, yeah. Unless you make it, like you, you're not really getting a good start because what's the chances of people making it these days? It's even less probably than we were there. Yeah, no. The thing <laughs> you know is, we did. We always got told it through the years, like off like coaches or whatever, or like off the education whoever was taking the, huh. the college or whatever. They'd always say like the percentage of people that actually make it's very low, so like prepare. But yeah. you don't you don't think that as a young lad, and I think like you said, like the last year of school, you're missing. Like a quarter of the week, pretty much yeah. to go and play football, kind of thing, and and then you're doing the college coach, which like a lot of people don't take seriously. Like it's quite easy. it's it's nah, easy, it's you know, easy. yeah, it's easy to pass. Yeah. But and what can you prepare for when you're playing football twenty four seven? It's hard. Like exactly. most lads are like they come out and they're like, "Fuck, what the fuck am I gonna do here?" Yeah. So but I know some people would say, "Oh, go and get like a part time job doing this," but like when you are trained until six at night. You, yeah. you come home, especially doing double days, you just sleep, you just want to go to bed, eat something and go to bed. Big style Wake up and, I know, and literally that's, that's all I used to do, just get home. Like I used to take us an hour to get the training, so by the time I got home, I was like falling asleep driving. Mm. Just like, get home, you're just, you're just out. I think I used to, there was a few times yeah. I was in bed by like six o'clock. Oh yeah, and definitely. then you're up again the next day. Did you um? Did you not stay in digs like no? No, nah, so I could have, but I wasn't really, I liked staying, I liked, staying at home I think I, I wasn't ah, really like too far away I think the fact that there's traffic in the morning just made it worse like if, if I drove there now it was like uh-huh. half an hour right so yeah, I'm only 20 minutes away and I, I, I stayed in digs for the first six months I had to drive like did you um, that was a that was a rough time <laughs> yeah I know that's the thing staying in digs as well with a bunch of lads it's I've heard it's carnage anyway we were just in pairs us like we got paired off oh, right. just, like, you get a, if you get a family that's like I don't know, cook shit food and that, like you're, you're stuck, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. But they're not like cooking that. like nutritious food and stuff like that. It's probably just whatever they're whipping up for, the, for, their, for their family or yeah. whatever. So, uh, so starting, started, you went to DW, you were there for five mm-hmm. months, and then where did you go after that? Um, the, J, the JD gyms were opening a gym in Sunderland, and again, that lad who I've mentioned who was training with the other bloke at the, the local gym to me. He was going to make the jump there and he's one of my good friends. So I thought, oh, mint, I can go and work here with, with, me, with my good friend. It's closer to home. And I've always believed, obviously, in the PT game and commercial gyms, 
if you're the first one in the gym, I, it's brand new. It's a brand new business. It's always easy to start a business. Yeah. So I just, I, it was a no brainer really. It's close to home and it was a chance to start a newer business. So the clients that I'd worked so hard to get a DW, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, and, and at the time I didn't have any thought of doing anything online. So that wasn't even a picture then. So yeah. it was just a case of up and go and, and, and go to JD like I, so yeah. I was there for a year. You pick yeah, up clients pretty quickly there and stuff. Yeah, I very quick. I had we did like a two week phase of the gym, like prior to the gym opening, and uh, week one was like an introduction. Week two was like everyone's gonna come and view the gym, so you got to take people around on tours and stuff. And I just made sure I, I was like taking people's tours off them. I was just taking everyone, <laughs> giving them a business card and stuff. And I think the first week I must have done about eighty hours, like no joke. Like yeah. eight hours of PT, and then from there, that was it. My business was set. I had everyone from there. Yeah. So you've got to be, you've got to be that face that people remember, though, don't you? Yeah, you've definitely. got to be that face straight away. Like, oh, that's the guy who goes like the JD gym. Go and go and speak mm-hmm. to him. Which I think. But, like, uh, go on, on, you carry on. Sorry, carry on. I was just going to say, like again, like from that mentality that I had at DW, to go in and do that. I did the same with JD, and guys who didn't weren't aware that that's what you have to be like. They were just happy sitting back and standing at the desk, and I was like. You're gonna regret that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I was taking their tools off them and going, "Oh, you just wait there. I'll take them." And they're like, "Oh yeah, go on." <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, man. So Thank was, you. Yeah. <laughs> Happy days. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That definitely. And then you were there for a year, just yeah. doing. Was it just all one-to-one stuff? Or did you do group, small yeah. group stuff then? Did a little bit of pairs stuff. Um, I actually did shift patterns for them um, to, to to not pay rent for some reason when I'd just been paying rent at DW. I had like double the clients at JD, but I just never made that jump to go on the rent, which was very strange. Yeah. And um, so I was doing like 15 hours for them and then like 30 plus hours of PT, single sessions and pairs. Um, yeah. And then I got like a new idea to go into small group. Um, and I made, again, I, I think I'd probably say I'll grew JD and then move to a more private sort of setup in some of which yeah. is um, Performance Fitness Centre. Which is yeah. a top class room, like it's really good. That's good. Man. Did you? That's where I'm at now. So obviously, like P, do one one PT and stuff. It's it's when you've got loads of clients and you're really busy. It's long days. Did you find it tough? Mm. Saying that you you were doing a lot of hours at Sunderland anyway. Did you find it tough transitioning from the football to the long hours of PT? Because to be fair, I found it quite not weird, but I found it long. Obviously, going from football full time football, and then I remember my first like eight hour shift or something like for example like that yeah, felt yeah. like a long time did you find it like uh-huh. the same sort of yeah sort of obviously yeah I think it's not as fast paced so like the day doesn't go as quick but then also I think it's even more mentally draining the more people yeah. understand because they think oh all you do is stand there and like count reps and shit and it's like nah there's so much more that goes into it and obviously when you're there with them especially the one to one stuff you've got to like as soon as someone else comes in, your next client, it's like, boom, back to the beginning. You've got to like be on it straight away. Yeah. You like, can't look tired either, can you? Nah, You've got you to be 100%. Tired. <laughs> a lot of yeah, cats. Because they're going to thrive off you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're probably tired after, after a long day. So you've got to like, it's just constantly putting that front on to be the best sort of, like, give them the best service you can. Do you know what I mean? Which yeah. is tiring week in, day in, day out. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. Because, like, like you said, like, it's a people's like one hour out of the day when they can kind of let loose and kind of maybe oh, yeah. you're almost like sometimes you're like a counsellor some people that just like talk about oh, the day yeah, and yeah. stuff like they might be having bad times at home and that you're like their relief so you need to be on your game pretty much and give them some energy even if you don't feel like it so like I've talked to with loads of PTs and they say that's the exact exact same thing that a lot of people don't realise going into PT like it's yeah. not just standing there and stuff it's also not just that one hour session that you're giving the client it's also like the programming and stuff going behind scenes yeah. which I don't think a lot of people do like are you a one to kind of do you program all your clients kind of sessions or are you I know PTs that just make it off the head like, I went through a phase I'm not going to lie like I yeah, I think everyone does I think everyone thinks they can wing certain things mm-hmm. but like the standard that I want to be at and the price that I want to be at and what I want to be known for I can't perform that way to get to that level so I do everything by the book like everything you can think of and it is about working smarter and not harder and stuff. So it's about finding the systems. That's the biggest thing that, like the transition that you make when you're trying to make everything as best you possibly can without, again, for that, for that client's experience, mm-hmm. but also without, without flogging yourself. Because 
if you have like 40 clients and you're trying to keep adhere to that standard that you have for each one it's gonna kill you so like you've got to that's kind of in a way why i went to the group stuff in terms of the programming side of things but then everyone gets the same the individual aspect in terms of the goals and and like check-ins and, and things like that do you know what i mean so yeah. there's a lot of aspects to it and i do think people forget that it, it isn't just that hour that you're with uh, them um so yeah yeah it's an also way like i've I can't remember who I spoke to about, but it's also like an extra selling point as a PT. You might say like you're a PT, you're like thirty pound an hour, but you're not. It's not actually just thirty pound an hour, thirty pound a week. It's like thirty pound. You're getting this. You're doing programming. You've got to like that's a selling point as well. So if you're a new PT, for example, don't just say oh, I'm thirty pound an hour. Like that's not what you are. You're more than that. No. You offer this thirty pound a week. I'm you're getting programming check-ins. There's a lot more than just that one hour with me. So definitely, you've got definitely. you've got to remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there was something I was gonna say. Oh yeah, on about your not kind of over shooting yourself in terms of workload. Like you said, if you've got forty clients, are you, so you're kind of. I'm probably the same. I want to get to the point eventually where I'm at a point where I can cut my clients down and give them better quality rather than just going full quantity because you can go two mm. ways in terms of that. You can go. Oh, okay. Do you follow the likes of like TM Cycles? Have you heard of him before? He's like a bodybuilder, YouTuber, where he's, he's very, he's talked about in his podcast where he wants to be high value, but he doesn't want a lot of kind of clients kind of yeah. thing. So he wants, yeah, yeah, it's a high ticket, yeah. I yeah. think his online, online coaching is like nearly 200 quid or something like that, but he wants okay. to provide a high quality service because there's two ways you can go about it. You can go like high quantity, maybe not the best quality, like lower quality and then high quantity, mm -hmm. so low quantity and high quality. So yeah, yeah, I think more people these days are going for the quality rather than the quantity, just for the better lifestyle as well. Which is probably why the small groups kind of works a bit better for, for you as well. It does I? You've got I think it's client. the type of client you get as well. Like if you if you go for that quantity thing, you're gonna get someone who's more of a headache that you can't probably work with or help, and yeah. it just becomes more of a burden on you. It makes you hate your job. I've gone through all of that, and I've like recently got a business mentor the last year, and the way my attitudes gone towards the business and how I run it and my niche so to speak with the client um like it's it's really made me enjoy it even more like I literally love what I do now yeah like I don't get as wrong as I did before but now I literally love what I do and I yeah. uh, I, I look forward to the coaching aspect like the face to face to face thing I think a lot of people now as well are saying that like on social media is like like what it always is it's like made out to be something that's not so everyone thinks that online coaching is like amazing and like this new thing mm. but um i literally love the face-to-face -face stuff as well so yeah. like i'll always do that because i love it Simple yeah as i'm the same um, i, I think, do still want to go online thing as well yeah i'm I'm probably the same i do like that one-to-one face-to-face -face stuff and there's also a lot of people out there who might think that online coaching sounds great for them but the lifestyle might not suit them mentally because I know for me, if I'm in the house all day, because you're always you're gonna be in your house on your laptop or on your computer a lot, kind of thing. You miss you're not, although you might be talking like over Zoom or FaceTime or whatever, you might be doing that, but you're not getting that social interaction face to face. And some people might struggle mentally, and they might mm -hmm. struggle to actually get themselves into the routine of doing it because yourself, like you're self-employed, working for yourself. If you don't have that structure in place and you can't do it, then it's probably not the best thing for you. Whereas the one-to-one -one stuff, you mm. get that interaction. You've got to kind of get up and get out and stuff. So I'm, I'm probably on the same boat. I want to go fifty-fifty because I do enjoy that one-to-one -one yeah. aspect. Yeah. But it's whatever you enjoy it. And I'm a big believer in if you enjoy something, you're going to stay consistent with it, like for longer. Yeah, and definitely. then that'll that'll breed success massively. Definitely. So, what's your, in terms of your plans for after lockdown? Because I don't know when gyms are going to open or whatever. What have you got planned? Um, so my actual plan is a secret. I don't oh, want right. to say it. Don't give, but, don't um, give anything away. I, I can tell you that off off the podcast, but um, because I don't think it'll be in motion by the time you probably put this on, and I don't yeah. want to upset anyone. But I've got big plans, like something that I never thought I would probably do, but I've grew to really now want that. Um, I think it goes to the fact of like the atmosphere that i've created and the environment and the community so to speak uh within like the the training club and what are the philosophy that we're building up and stuff i've seen that in the gym that i'm currently in now just on a small basis 
and I absolutely love it. Like the lads love it. It's a great environment. I think everyone's like training levels up, everyone's focus levels up, and I want to take that to a much bigger scale if I can. And that is what I'm going to be working towards, basically, to do pretty much post-COVID. And I think it can be done post-COVID, even with like whatever measures that gets put in by the government. So yes. that is my plan, basically. Um, and obviously, I'm always trying to continue to grow the online aspect. Um, but again, for that quality, not quantity, uh-huh. um, and build like a higher ticket sort of service. Because I do think there's, there's something out there for the online thing. Like people think, ah. Oh, it can't be that good. But if you think about it, you've got someone in your pocket 24-7 mm-hmm. and everything's programmed, tailored to you. You can send videos, you can do all, like it's literally like I'm with you, but I'm not. So there is definitely a massive market for it and that is why everyone loves it. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the fact that people think it's like a quick success to get money is a lot of shite. It's like not. you've got to do the man hours first before you even think about going online. Yeah. And then also I think I've realised that the more standards you have and the better service you want to deliver, how much, how good your systems need to be in place to help someone online as well? Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh, I know, and I think because everybody, because everybody's doing it, like everyone's up to a certain level of service. Like everybody's level of service now is pretty decent. You've got to go that yeah, step yeah. beyond, like offer something that somebody else doesn't. It's got to be quality. Like we talked Definitely. about that. What's that? True, um, true, true coach. coach. Yeah, yeah. Up. yeah. I need to get, yeah, I need to uh-huh. get on that with my clients, like one hundred percent, just because they're. From what I've seen, that like you can just program things straight away. Mm-hmm. They can send you clips of their videos rather than like saying art like over WhatsApp or whatever, getting in touch. So yeah. just things like that offer things that other people don't offer. You've always got to mm-hmm. be thinking outside the box. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Definitely. So I'm interested. What's your to see plans it. after? What's your plans after? My plans, mate. My head's but I told you after about yeah. things in terms of right. my my um, well, it also involves football as well, but. In terms, okay? of per- in, ter- in terms of personal training and stuff like that, honestly, just continue because I'm very new to the game. Very new. Mm. I only started in December. So I'm just continuing picking up clients because I was getting to a point where I was getting pretty busy before yeah. lockdown, like literally just before. And then obviously things are happening. So continue that. And I want to try and keep on getting work with the online clients I've got at the minute and get some decent mm. transformations. But I'm, yeah, yeah, that's a social I'm, boost, Kaya. Yeah, I get very much in the mindset where I always have to keep doing certain things. Like my girlfriend tells me, like, you just focus on the things that you are doing rather than like keep on going on different avenues. Because if you keep on yeah. trying different things, you can never put hundred percent on one thing. So Definitely. I think I am the same. Definitely. So I'm terrible for that. It's like OCD or something. I can I can't sit still. I've got to be trying stuff. And to be fair though, mate, you've got your fingers on a lot of pie from what, pies from what I see, and you you like you're the finished product of each pie, so to speak, is good. Yeah. Like obviously you're tapping into YouTube podcasts. Like, yeah, you're getting you're getting yourself out there, like so. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? It's just persistence. Yeah. Isn't it? I appreciate that, but it's just I'm always I know what level I want to be at, and it's just you get yeah. frustrated when you're not there, oh. especially in terms of like for me, a little thing that I've got in my head, which is probably a, a bad thing in a way, is I'm comparing the like monthly income that I, like I was on in professional football compared mm. to what I'm on now, and I want to get. Mm. Like, I'm still not at the point where I was a few years ago, which is frustrating for me because at the age I was at. Like you talked about, you by this age you you set yourself a goal. Like you expect yourself to be in a certain yeah. place, and I'm like, because obviously I took a different path now for whatever reason. I'm not where I want to be, but I know I'm on the right path, and I'm enjoying the mm. process and stuff a lot more than yeah, I thought yeah. I would be, even though it's a completely different career. So that is, like I said, enjoyment's the main thing. But just gotta keep keep working at it. Anyway. Definitely. To be fair, there's a few questions that I didn't get into, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, where can people find you on social media? Get in touch with you. So I'm mainly on Instagram, and it is just Ross underscore Cahoon. All the best spelling it. Um, yeah. I'm sure you'll put it on there. I'll put it. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes <laughs> and on the YouTube yeah. in the description. So. <laughs> and for now, mate, that's pretty much all I'm all, all I'm on. I'm on LinkedIn for like online sort of stuff, and um, so you can reach out to us on there if you want to get in a conversation as well. Um, Facebook is just more private um, in terms of like my clients it's like a group for mm-hmm. them don't really put much content on there probably should but I'm just yeah main focus is Instagram so that's, that's where you'll find us yeah perfect give them a follow give them a follow anyway it's been a pleasure Ross mate we'll have a little chat because I'm going to hear about your little um, your plans for the future your secret plans yeah Spot on, mate. Mate. I really enjoyed it thank you that's been good Thanks cheers All right. no problem